Hi everyone, I'm Sandra Lilienthal. I'm an educator at Miami Sage's Florence Melton School of Adult Jewish Learning. And it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you to the Miami Jewish Film Festival's virtual speaker series event. We're thrilled to have director Casio Polar with us today, who will be talking about his point in film, Mama Liga Blues. Before we begin, I want you to know that you will have a chance to ask Casio or myself any questions you may have, but after our discussion, which should take about 20 minutes. If you have a question, we would like you to please find the raise hand button on your screen and you will be called upon in the order you press the button. Please make sure to unmute yourself when it's your turn to ask a question and then mute yourself again once you are finished with your question. So it's now my pleasure to ask Claudio to talk a little bit about himself, about how he grew up, what kind of a family he's part of, and how he got into movie making. Casio, welcome. Okay. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Sandra for uh, mediating this. Thank Igor and Judy that I personally met in 2015 at the Miami Jewish Film Festival. Thank you the whole staff and Douglas for coordinating this. Uh, well, I was born in uh, south of Brazil, Porto Alegre, and into a Jewish family. My, both of my parents are Jewish. Um, I never had a very uh, traditional Jewish education, but I went to Jewish school, I did my bar mitzvah, but we weren't uh, very uh, religious, I would say. But I, I knew of all festivities, and I, I think I remember some Hebrew. Uh, and I always wanted to, to, to live abroad, so when, I think when I was 27 years old, I moved to the um, United States to take my master's in film. And before that, I was already working film in Brazil. I was always interested in film. There was nothing else I, I wanted to do. So I, I went after my dream. Uh, I always wanted to work professionally in film. And I was already working in Brazil. I was directing for TV when I moved to the, to the States, to San Francisco. After two years in San Francisco, I moved to Los Angeles where I lived for nine years. And I did some films. I directed some um, TV shows, some pilots. I worked on some... Uh, subtitling and translating some films from English to Portuguese. I worked in some post-production houses and I, in 2013, I finished my, my first uh, uh, documentary film, Mama Liga Blues, which is the one we're gonna talk about today. And shortly after that, I moved back to Brazil with my wife, she's American, and my daughter who was born in Los Angeles. Uh, we're back in Porto Alegre where I was born. I have a second kid now and still working on film, on Jewish projects and non-Jewish related films. I don't know how much time I have, but um, I'm teaching film here too. Uh, and uh, yes, I'm interested in, in, in documentary fiction. I'm developing now a fiction film about Senegalese immigrants in the south of Brazil about a guy that actually meets a Jewish woman and they have a little flirt. So um, yeah, and I'm happy to be here talking about this film that was very important to me. Um, and it's, uh, I'm glad that it still has some interest after uh, some years after its release. So it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So for our viewers who might not know, I actually also was born and raised in Brazil. And uh, one of the things that I noticed a big difference when I moved to the United States is the fact that most Brazilian Jews, not all of course, but most Brazilian Jews um, are only two or three generations removed from the Holocaust. Uh, most of us have relatives that experience the Holocaust. Um, whereas most of my American Jewish friends their families had been here much longer, so the Holocaust is more something that they learned in school, but not that they experienced. So talk about, tell us a little bit about how this conversation about the Holocaust happened in your house. Did your relatives talk to you about it? Were you aware of the history of the family growing up, or is this something that you came across at an older age? Uh, I think the subject of the Holocaust was always present in our family. Um, the general history of the Holocaust, not our family story, not the subject of immigration, but the story of the Holocaust as a general thing was always present. And I was, I, 
I always been in contact with the story of Holocaust through movies, through the, through the school, but uh, I never knew much about my my grandparents who moved from from Moldova or at that time the Sarabia to Brazil, uh, and that story that I that I never knew anything about it, and my parents also never knew about their own past. Mm -hmm. That was the thing that I was I went after. So yes, Holocaust was present, but not the story about my family. That that was something that was always absent. Did you ask questions growing up? Would you ask questions about what happened, how they ended up in Brazil, and Constantly. how did they react when you asked questions? Constantly, uh, uh, since since at an early age, I was always very interested and curious. Uh, for me, it was really hard to imagine that I belonged to such a distant part of the world, that, that I had relatives that came from a different reality. It was always like, I, I, I couldn't believe that it was real. I would see their pictures. That was the only thing I had, was some black and white pictures of them dressed up in like all this like fur coats in the middle of the snow, and they look different, they behave differently. Uh, my dad could only talk about some things that he knew, but he never asked questions to his parents. Is, is that what we said, right? The, 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 so the grandparents came to Brazil and never talked about it. The second generation never asked the questions. And it, 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 it happened, it so happened that the third generation, like me, are the ones that are starting to ask these questions. I guess we're a little bit more emotionally distant from, from, from what they went through. And we were able to ask these questions and bring it try to bring it back to the present day. So I find um, in my own history, and I think I see a little bit of that in your movie as well, I find being the third generation also, A, we are a little more removed, so it's easier to ask the questions, but also I think that we feel a certain lack of roots that we don't really know what to do with. So you grow up in a place, and you're in my, in your case, my case, Brazil, but it could be United States or any other place in the world. You grow up trying desperately to, to understand wh where are these roots coming from? What, what was my beginning and what was the culture I come from? And, you know, we all want to know who we are. And uh, Judaism talks a lot about us being descendants of our ancestors and how important it is to not only understand but to a certain point live that history through ourselves and pass it down to the next generations and yet we don't feel those roots and we don't know about that um i would like you to talk a little bit about how you got into all of this genealogical research and how important it was to you to actually make that trip because it's one thing to learn about your past and the other thing is to experience it mm -hmm. Well, um, I was always obsessed by by my roots, by the past, by the history. But it was only with the development of the internet and technology, and it was only after I moved to the U.S. I was able to be more in touch with people that had been to Moldova or with resources that started to become available in the internet. So before that, it was almost impossible. Uh, it was we had like phone uh, car uh, uh, letters and you know it was hard i mean i remember the first time i met somebody that was born in moldova i was like oh my god this is amazing because the u.s is a country of immigrants we we're able to be in touch with these people right uh we have in the, in the u.s you have communities that come from all over the world and that's one of the one of the things that make the country so amazing so I was able to start to exchange information with these people. And it was only after I, I became in contact with Jewish Gen that I started to, to research more and become more in contact uh, with, with the logistics of going to Moldova, which was something to me until then almost unbelievable, almost something like forbidden to do. And so the what was a dream in the past started slowly to become a reality when I when I started to get information on how to go to Moldova, how to get in contact with researchers and guides. And I started to make a genealogy research and hired people in Moldova to do research for me, started to get in contact with Jewish 
uh, local uh, community leaders in Moldova and in the United States. So it was a long process. The film took nine years to be completed. And I think from these nine years, five years were just purely research. Mm. That before was impossible to do it at my home. <laughs> and in the United States, that became much more available and the, the, the possibility of the internet. I'm not sure if I answer all the questions. I started to talk and I, I don't remember exactly. Well, you, you certainly answered the first part. The <laughs> second part that, that I asked is that how important it was for you to be there. Um, and the reason I asked that question is because when I was watching the movie, one of the things that was very clear to me is we have the custom during the Seder. One of the things that we read in our Haggadah is that we have to feel as if we ourselves had left Egypt. And that was always a very important comment to me and my understanding of what it is to be Jewish, that it's not just that you need to have the information, but that really feeling that history is very important. And for you to pick up and go on search of that one grave that you had in the picture, right, is really, to me, very similar to that. It's experiencing that life. It's going back and putting your, and walking where your ancestors walked literally not just figuratively yeah i think you said something very important that we as a third generation we are uh, emotionally distant from what happened in the past and i think that's what i was looking for i was looking for this not only for information but for the emotional connection so going to moldova was okay i need to know about the history and get information and meet people who may have met my my family, but at the same time, I wanted to breathe the same air they breathed one day. I wanted to be, to touch the same grounds they touched one day. And I wanted to be able to feel something, right? Uh, so I would say that the whole trip, yeah, taking the trip was extremely important. Uh, on a rational level, yes. On an emotional level, I would say that uh, the only time that I was able to feel something uh, to get this emotional connection so distant from us is when I was next to the grave. And that was the only time where I felt that uh, something that my grandfather may have felt, that his parents were so important to him, that he made such a big grave that was actually the biggest grave in that cemetery you can see from very far away where two people are buried. And so uh, they spent so much money, time and effort to make that grave. So, and after that, he left Moldova and went to the United, and went to Brazil. So uh, having the parents killed, I mean, I felt like he, the, the family loved so much the parents that they made that big grave for them as a, as a homage, right? As a, as a memorial for them. And, and that is something that I could feel. I don't know if it's, this feeling is real, it really happened, but that was the probably the only moment that I could really feel a connection. And it so was very that, important. Because that's sort of the end of the movie. I, I yes. wanna ask a, some, a question before. When you went home the first time, so the first trip that you made, you spent, a lot of time, you did a lot of research, you spoke to a lot of people, and you left empty-handed. You yeah. were unable to locate anything. Two questions on that. How, how did it feel to you leaving with like, I've spent all my life doing this much research and getting here and really wanting to be here, and now I'm leaving with nothing? And how did you go from that to a few years later saying, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna try again. Okay, so there are many things that are not in the film because uh, as a film, uh, we not only want to document something, but we need to tell a story, right? So the first cut of the film had three hours. Uh, we went to many places that are not in the film. We had a, I have a, did a lot of interviews that are not in the film. So a lot, of, a lot I would say the film is 40% of our trip, right? It's 50 minutes, 55 minutes long. And I had like this three hours, three hours and a half film. So um, the first trip, yes, I didn't find the grave in the first trip, but it was, I found other things. It was not only about the grave, right? The grave was probably the most important, but I found the place where my um, great uncles had been, my great uncle had been killed with his wife in, in Chipliwoods. 
uh, I found people who knew my family. I was able to, to find documents that the researcher found uh, and, and translated to us. So I was able to find things. I didn't leave completely empty handed. So I had somewhat a feeling of satisfaction, uh, but yeah, we still needed to, to find the grave. And what happened, and I tried to include that in the film, but didn't work narrative wise, was that uh, two months after I came back, we came back, I got an email from our guide, Natasha, with the picture of the grave nowadays. And she's like, is this the grave? Just that. And I was like, oh my God, yeah. And I got the old picture and I compared. And yes, that was the grave. So she explained to me, and that was the craziest thing about it all. She, she had seen the grave before our first trip. Wow. But she had completely forgot it. And when, for some reason, she was going through her pictures, she, she knew about that grave, I don't know, like years before our trip, our first trip. She had camped in the cemetery with an Israeli woman and took pictures. And that grave had called her attention at that time because it was the biggest grave. And something made her, I don't remember now, something made her uh, go back to those pictures. And she found that picture and she was able to connect with me. And she sent that picture. But it seemed the interesting thing, and then I said, okay, I have to go back. <laughs> but also the interesting thing is that she told me when, when I went, when I was in Moldova again, the first trip was 2008, the second was two years later, 2010. When I went back in 2010, she also said that the police that were also looking for the grave actually found it and told her, got in contact with her, hey, we found the grave. So that was interesting uh, that she knew about the grave even before we traveled, but had forgotten there was something that was not in her radar, um, which is something crazy. And then that made us come back. Yeah. So I'm going to ask one last question before we open up to our audience. Um, I understand from watching the movie that most of the people in Moldavia that you were in, ch in, in touch with had never seen a Jew in their lives. So my question to you is, do they know about Jews? Does the majority of people know about Jews and they have never met one because most of the Jews left? Or did, did they not even know what a Jew was? And it seems to me that a lot of people were really willing to help you. They, they were showing a lot of goodwill and, and really trying to help you to the extent that they could. Um, why do you think that is so? Uh, yeah, first thing, people are very warm and friendly. Um, and I, I'm not sure exactly why. I have some ideas. I, knew, I know of other people that went there and, and met some people that were aggressive towards them. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not saying that everybody's warm and friendly in Moldova, but they were with me, uh, with our family. I think... Uh, well, I don't speak Russian or Romanian, so we were, I think we were very protected and shielded by our guide, right, Natasha. She was in contact, direct contact with the people and translating for us. I don't know if they said anything that Natasha never translated back to us, maybe, but also I think Natasha made it very easy for everybody, right? Natasha was a great guide, and I think uh, all the communication was through her and somewhat she made it very easy for us. So people were very warm. People were very friendly. They were, I felt they were genuine, genuine and trying to help us. They always try, they always invited us to go to their house and drink their homemade wine, eat their food. And they really wanted to get to know more about us. And they were really interested, everybody. Uh, I was never at any point, I never felt anything negative. I was very comfortable there. Um, I think it was a little bit of Natasha's work, a little bit of luck. And I think people in Moldova are warm. Yes, they are friendly. Um, and also I never pushed. I never said, do you have any family that killed Jews? I never asked, do you know anybody that, do you have any parents, any relatives? Do you have any friends that were, anti-Semites who, who worked for the Nazis, worked for the Kuzis party. I never faced them. I never pushed anything. So because I, it was not my objective, it was not my goal. I just wanted to get information and find a grave. I didn't want to 
test them on their beliefs, basically. I also imagine that coming from Brazil, it actually did make a difference um, in the sense that, you know, Brazil is, uh, most people know about Brazil from soccer um, yes. and they're very intrigued by Brazilians, right? Um, I encounter this to this day in certain places where they say, oh, but so what, how, how is life in Brazil? There's sort of a, um, a lack of knowledge of what it is to live in Brazil. And I think that because Brazilians are also very friendly, that might have, you know, a good impression on them and they they might react positively for sure i think i was probably the only brazilian in moldova that that, that week and that made them very curious yeah that's for sure uh I, I actually when i was there i didn't see anybody else from latin america i went to a film festival i went to an opera house i went to a few events and there were europeans from other countries but no not even americans or australians or canadians but uh, and no, no people from Latin America. So yes, they were very curious and open when we saw when they saw Brazilians, for sure. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I want to remind everybody that if you have a question, please just put it in the chat box. Raise your hand. We will call on you. Um, in the meantime, I have one more question, Concio. Can you tell us a little bit about how your father reacted? With you mentioned in our talk in the beginning that your father did not ask questions. It was the second generation that did not ask questions. Um, how did he react when you said to him, I think I'm going to go back because I want to feel life there and I want to go looking for our history and our roots? Mm -hmm. um, he gave total support, uh, but my father is not the kind of person that shows a lot of him. But uh, I knew that he was excited about it. And when I called him from, from Vadurashkov, he was very touched. Um, and I, I even mentioned to him, do you feel like going back there and going to, to see the grave? I can take you there. Uh, we can take you there. But he never showed interest. It's like, no, I, did, I went once. It's fine. Also, he started to get older and his health, his health started to, to get worse. But uh, for him, the best thing about the trip was meeting our cousin. That's not in the film. We met him in, the, in Germany. We have a cousin that it's around my age, Shlomi, that his grandfather was the son of uh, a brother of my father's father. So to him, meeting somebody that is still alive from the family, that was to him the most important thing. So I think my father is more connected to live things than dad thinks <laughs> these days. So that to him was emotional to meet That's somebody. That's a very interesting yeah. point. And, and you mentioned that you were able through this film, um, you were actually able to find relatives around the world that you did not even know existed. Is that, did I understand that correctly? Correct, through the research, through, through exhibition screenings of the film, uh, I found relatives in the Ukraine, in Ukraine, I found relatives in Luxembourg, in Germany, in New York, in Los Angeles, people that are our direct relatives that lived uh, like a few blocks from me and I <laughs> never knew them. I met them when I was already in Brazil, uh, relatives in Pennsylvania. So yes, uh, and that was, I mean, Topolar is a very small family and, and, and I was very surprised to see there's still some of us spread out in, in the world. Have you like had any, any family reunion, whether virtual or, I mean, it's a new thing doing virtual things, but have you had a chance to, to get together in some way as a bigger family? No, that's a good question and a good idea. I never thought about it. Um, well, uh, that would be very interesting, um, especially the younger generation that came from, from, from this family. Uh, some of us are, are still uh, alive. And uh, of course, the, the, some relatives are getting older, like in the 70s in Ukraine, and they don't speak any English, so it's hard. The communication is hard. I was able to Skype a few times, but it's been always hard. Uh, but I would say, I never thought about that. Maybe it'll happen someday, soon, I hope. All right, that would be, a, I know people used to have these big family reunions where they would bring everything to get everybody together with t-shirts and, you know, family reunion. Um, but a lot of people can't come, but if you can do something online, uh, just reminding, if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. We will call on you. 
Um, and Kasio, you were talking about um, the, the difference between the generations. So I want to go now to the next generation. How do your children, I know your son is still very young, but you mentioned your daughter has some interest in genealogy. How, is, how does she see the family history? Of course, she's even more um, removed from Holocaust and she's still young and it's not, ne not necessarily the best thing to be talking about Holocaust, Holocaust, but how does she relate to family history? And how are you passing this story down to her? Because as you said, you did not receive this story. You had to go after it. How are you passing it down to her? Right. Um, it's interesting. Melina, uh, which she's in the film, she's now nine years old, and she's very interested and curious about family history, about the past, about uh, Judaism. Because uh, I think because of me, she, she feels it from me through my research but also participating in the film and she's seen the film many times and, and she's seen my bar mitzvah video a few times too. So she's very curious and interested. Uh, I think experiencing that makes her interested. And sometimes we go to the synagogue. I'm not uh, extremely religious, but we go sometimes on Shabbat and she always likes to come with me and she asks questions. So I think it, uh, it's important um, I always say that to me the most important thing is that uh, minority groups, minority people, um, I think they have the duty to keep the memory alive, right, of their ancestors and, and passing that on to future gener generations, even if they don't have the emotional connection to what happened in the past, they need to learn and they need to experience that somehow. So I would say that with Melina, I feel very happy that she is interested in that. Lucas is still very young, he's eight and he's six, he doesn't care much about it, but hopefully he'll start being interested in the near future. It's also beautiful, and I, I am sharing this without having asked for permission, but I had a chance before we went live to speak for a few minutes with Cassio's daughter, and I asked her if she had any, you know, if she remembered anything, and she said she sort of remembers putting little stones on the grave which is such an amazing thing to hear from a child that this is her recollection. It's a Jewish ritual and she experienced it as a very young child to ancestors, which to me was such a moving thing to hear. So obviously she's connecting to that history, which hopefully she will one day then pass down to her descendants. Um, keeping, as you said, the memory alive. It is our obligation to keep the memory of those who could not be around um, alive. Their stories, the only way that we can avoid tragedies like the Holocaust is really by talking about it, knowing that it happened, knowing that it can happen again, whether to Jews or any other minority, as you mentioned, and that it is important we have a responsibility to keep their memories alive and to ensure that things like this no longer happen. And Correct. just to wrap it up, Kasia, what would be your message to those people who are searching for their roots, who have not yet been able to find their, their history? Right, and th there are many, many people like my age that are searching for their roots. I would say um, it's not easy, it's a, it's a detective job. Uh, it requires a lot of, I think the first thing you need to be obsessed. If you're not obsessed, you may not find what you, what you want, what you're looking for, because uh, it can be very frustrating at some times. You can be um, driven to, to, to false paths or given false information that happens all the time. But you need to be obsessed. That, that's what makes you go and you need to be organized with the information, organize your information so it's easy to get messed up and confused about information. Uh, and you need a little bit of discipline too because uh, something that I would do almost every day, review information, keep going, research. There's a new website, I'll go after it. I'll look for, go back. Jewish Channel is amazing. Um, I had a website before, I had a Mama Liga Blues website with a list of uh, uh, genealogy tools. Um, they are very much available these days that we didn't have it in the past that people could use. Uh, so it's everything up to you, I would say. Uh, the tools are available. Uh, and even I think each year there's more people interested in their past, not only Jewish people. 
And I think it's up to you. I think you need to be obsessed because it's not an easy job, but it's very uh, rewarding, I would say. Great. So, Cassia, thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to have done this. I hope we will stay in touch. And I thank our viewers. I hope they enjoyed the movie. I hope they enjoyed our conversation. And if there's anything you would like to end with, the floor is yours. Uh, no, if there anybody who's watching doesn't, doesn't want to ask any questions right now, you can get in touch with me on, I'm on Facebook. Um, easy to find. I'm on uh, uh, Instagram. I have a website, casatopolar.com. So if you want to get in touch with me later for any questions, any reason, you're more than welcome to. And thanks again for, for having me. Thank you. And thank you to all of this amazing staff at Miami Jewish Film Festival that has made this possible.